Thank you everyone for joining us today on the Bethel Dukes branch of Asala's second program for the new year, 2021. Uh, today we have with us uh, Dr. Alice, Allison Parker, who will be our guest speaker, uh, LaVonda Broadneck, uh, who is a retired librarian from the Library of Congress, will be introducing Dr. Parker. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Jones, Ida Jones, who is the president of our local branch, Bethel Dukes. And we invite you to join our Bethel Dukes branch of Asala. Um, and you will see that information in the chat, how to do that. And uh, Demita Green, who is our technician and keeping us up and running in terms of all of our presentations. And we've had a whole host of uh, wonderful presentations this year and last year. Next month, I just want to mention that our guest speaker will be uh, Dr. Paula Seniors. And she'll be talking about uh, <clears throat> um, May Baloney and the Monroe Defense Committee in the World Revolution. It's a new book that she's a uh, forthcoming book that she is publishing and uh, but she'll be here with us next month to discuss that, discuss her book and discuss uh, that topic. And we look forward to that. Um, I hope a, a number of you have had a chance to join in and see some of the uh, solar programs. You know, we are just coming out of uh, Black History Month and uh, a solar national has had a, a number of wonderful programs that you can see. And I invite you to go back to watch a uh, solid talk TV uh, by going to the Asala uh, website and tune into their TV channel. And you can see a number of the speakers that you might've missed this month. And it's important history that we're sharing on an ongoing basis. So please do check into a solid TV. And also please consider joining our branch, our next speaker. Um, we have those who have registered, we will get information out about our, ongoing, our next program. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to LaVonda, who will introduce our guest speaker. Uh, well, before we do that, I'm going to, uh, defer to our president, Ida Jones, who has just been welcomed from the branch. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Eric. Uh, Dr. Parker, welcome, and welcome audience, both on Facebook, as well as our branch members, both local and national. I just want to share with you very briefly that the Association for the Study of African American Life and History was founded in 1915 by the visionary Dr. Carter G. Woodson, an academically trained historian who sought to integrate the accomplishments in the agency of African-American people into the American narrative. Since 1915, the association has continuously and ongoingly talked about, celebrated, shared, and promoted African-American history, culture, accomplishments, and agency in concert with both domestic and international persons around the world. Today, we are now over 100 and six years old and actually what we're seeking to do now is live out the Woodson vision through branches. There are branches throughout the country in various cities, states, and hamlets around the world and we in Washington DC have three branches. We at the Bethel Dukes branch used to be the old far east far northeast southeast branch and we're comprised of both librarians, archivists, historians, lay and professional historians as well as institutional partners. Every month we have our meetings on the fourth Sunday and we have speakers who come and share elements of African-American history according to the black history theme. The black history theme as you see over Mr. White's left shoulder is the black family, representation, identity and diversity. Today's speaker, Dr. Parker has written an astounding new work on the life and personal life and professional life of Mary Church Terrell. So we're looking forward to an engaging discussion. As mentioned, I'll put our email address in the chat, Bethel Dukes branch at gmail.com so you can learn more about us but also visit asalh.org to learn more about the organization that Woodson started. Thank you and I will now ask Ms. Broadnecks to introduce our speaker. Thank you and enjoy. Good afternoon everyone and welcome. Dr. Allison M. Parker is chair and Richards Professor of American History at the University of Delaware. She's also the co-chair 
of the University of Delaware's Anti-Racism Initiative. In that capacity, Dr. Parker is helping to build a coalition of students, faculty, and staff promoting a wide ranging anti-racism agenda. She also serves as the founding editor of the Gender and Race in American History book series for the University of Rochester Press. Among other publications, Dr. Parker is the author of the monographs Articulating Rights, 19th Century American Women on Race, Reform, and the State, which was published in 2010. She's also the author of Purifying America, Women, Cultural Reform, and Pro-Censorship Activism, 1873 to 1933. This was published in 1997. In 2017 to 2018, Dr. Parker was an Andrew W. Mellon Advanced Fellow at the James Weldon Johnson Institute for the Study of Race and Difference at Emory University. During this time, she researched Unceasingly Militant, The Life of Mary Church Terrell, which is a part of the John Hope Franklin series in African American History and Culture of the University of North Carolina Press. This work is the first full biography of Mary Church Terrell. A couple of examples of insight from the biography in conjunction with Asala's 2021 theme, The Black Family, include Mary Church Terrell's and other Black women's reproductive and health challenges in the face of racism, including the traumas of lynching and discriminatory treatment in segregated hospitals, informed Mary Church Terrell's leadership of the National Association of Colored Women from 1896 to 1901. Another example, pointing to the Black women's higher maternal and infant mortality rates, Ms. Terrell demanded a federal anti-lynching law and challenged segregation while also calling for more training of Blacks in medical and nursing schools and for the founding of day nurseries for the infants of working mothers. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Allison M. Parker as she highlights the fabulous, the courageous, the unsung, the unceasingly militant civil rights and women rights activist, Mary Church Terrell. Thank you. Thank you for such a lovely introduction. And thank you to Eric White, Ida Jones, and the Bethel Dukes branch of Asala for inviting me to speak. I'm really happy to be here today. I'm going to try sharing my PowerPoint and start it from the beginning. Oops, dear me, jumping ahead of things here. Sorry, now we're on board here. Um, I'd like to start by talking about Mary or Molly Church, who began her life in an era of cruelty and tumult and hope, hope because she was born in the middle of the Civil War on September 23rd of 1863 in Memphis, Tennessee. In spite of having spent her first two years enslaved, Molly Church grew up in a privileged household. She learned to use her class privilege, education, light skin color, and cross-class and cross-race connections in tactical ways to work on a wide range of social justice and civil rights causes. Terrell lived in Washington, D.C. for over 60 years, working as an educator, journalist, public speaker, 
political campaign organizer and civil rights activist. She brought her energy, leadership and determination through to the post-World War II civil rights movement. After winning a 1953 legal challenge to District of Columbia segregation in shops and restaurants in the US Supreme Court, Terrell lived just long enough to see the court issue its 1954 landmark decision in Brown v. Board of Education. Unabashedly ambitious and passionate about social justice, Terrell claimed she would have run for a seat in the US Senate to pursue her civil rights agenda, if not for the barriers that blocked African American women from attaining such positions of political power. A full 10 years after women secured the franchise, suffragist uh, Molly Church Terrell had not yet had the opportunity to vote. She was a resident of Washington, D.C., which, as you well know, was administered by Congress and had no representation on Capitol Hill. In 1930, Terrell finally had the opportunity to vote. She wrote excitedly back to her daughter in D.C. that while working on the Senate campaign of the Republican representative Ruth Hannah McCormick, she had registered in Illinois using her other daughter's Chicago address, saying, I have worked for suffrage all my life, and the first vote I shall be able to cast will be for the first woman who has had the courage to run for the United States Senate. That certainly gives me a kick. In spite of the limitations Terrell encountered, by the time of her death, she had become one of the most prominent Black women in the nation. Many of you might be familiar with this brief overview of Terrell's life, but just in case you're not, I'll give it anyhow. In 1895, Terrell was appointed as the first Black woman on the District of Columbia's Board of Education. The next year, she was elected as the first president of the uh, National Association of Colored Women, or NACW. And this is a wonderful photo from 1896 that uh, Ida Jones helped me uh, with. We, we worked with another librarian at Oberlin, Cecilia Robinson, and managed to identify almost every woman in this picture. Uh, what I would point to is that this on the uh, far left with the fruit and the feathers is Mary Church Terrell sitting down. And then in the middle holding the baby is um, Alice Moore who becomes Alice Dunbar Nelson. And her the baby is not her baby, it's Charles Barnett. And that the mother of the baby is actually Ida B. Wells Barnett who's sitting down below. So um, it's a, it's a nice thing to be able to share that. So I just thought I would uh, identify at least a couple people, but that's uh, there. But then in 1909, Terrell helped found the NAACP along with Ida B. Wells. They were the only two black women. During World War I, she picketed the White House for women's suffrage with the National Women's Party and created the Wage Earners Association to encourage unionization amongst African-American women workers. In the 1920s, she was a founding member of the International Council of Women of the Darker Races. In the 1930s, she continued her activism in the NAACP's DC branch and joined with the Communist Party's International Labor Defense on behalf of poor African Americans treated unfairly by the criminal justice system, such as the Scottsboro Nine. In the 1940s, she helped A. Philip Randolph organize the March on Washington movement, initiated a lawsuit to integrate the American Association of University Women, and supported striking Black cafeteria workers who were resisting signing anti-communist pledges. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, Terrell spoke before congressional committees in favor of the Equal Rights Amendment, and she also chaired two important committees affiliated with the Civil Rights Congress, an organization supported by the Communist Party. One committee demanded freedom for a Black sharecropper, Rosalie Ingram and her sons, who had struck out in self-defense, but had been wrongly convicted of murdering her white male assailant. The other committee's direct action protests and legal challenges successfully dismantled segregation in the nation's capital. Over the course of her long life, Molly Church Terrell's range of activism and alliances was extraordinary, and yet she has never before, as was mentioned, been the subject of a full-length scholarly biography. 
focusing on her family history of enslavement and freedom during the Reconstruction era and its connection to her activism. This talk shares some of the information about Terrell's family that I was able to uncover in my research for her biography. Molly Church had a childhood defined by love and nurturing, but also by discrimination and violence. Racism shaped her understanding of herself and her world and made her determined to assert her own value as a human being through her civil rights activism. In this talk, I will suggest how her family history connects to her activism, and I can share more about her many decades of activism in the question and answer period if you're interested. When he was an adult at the turn of the century, Molly Church Terrell's father, Robert Church, learned of his family history from letters he received from his former white enslavers, in which they offered their own self-serving versions of the past. His white enslavers family lore held that Robert Church's grandmother, Lucy, a seamstress and caregiver to her mother's children, uh, her master's children, uh, was a beautiful French speaking girl brought to the United States between 1805 and 1810 on a ship from the French colony of Saint-Domingue. One letter to Robert Church recounted how his grandmother had been sold to a rich Virginia tobacco merchant after a fierce bidding war. She had, he was told, attracted a great deal of attention by her beauty and the jewelry she wore and consequently bought a fancy price. Slave holding men's interest in an enslaved woman's beauty was not a compliment. Being a fancy girl typically meant she was purchased to be sexually available to her white enslaver and for her reproductive capacity against her free agency to choose. Indeed, while enslaved on the tobacco merchant's plantation, Lucy gave birth to a half white daughter, Emmeline. Lucy's second enslaver was a white Virginian named Dr. Patrick Burden, and this is the best image I have of him. But he had participated in the first auction and finally managed to acquire her around 1825. Another white Burton descendant explained to Robert Church that my grandfather bought your grandmother Lucy, who at the time had a most beautiful young daughter that she named Emmeline. This Emmeline is your mother. He then casually revealed, my grandmother made my mother, who was then his baby, a present of this girl, Emmeline, for her maid. Emmeline was barely older than her young mistress. In their letters, written long after the Civil War and Reconstruction, the Burton family insisted to Robert Church that his grandmother and mother were their beautiful prized slaves who, quote, never did any menial work. Although it is true that they did no agricultural work, they worked from very young ages as seamstresses, personal maids, and caretakers of the Burton children. Most heinously, the Burtons sold Lucy away from her child, Emmeline. A Burton descendant described this cruel separation of mother and daughter as a simple economic calculus. In the changing scenes of commercial life, grandfather had a debt and was forced to send 100 Negroes at one time from Virginia to Mississippi to be sold. Among the number was your grandmother, Lucy. She was bought by a very rich planter near Natchez, Mississippi, who gave her the same liberty of action our family had, and she became the seamstress of the family. Never in her life was she treated as a slave. This event separated your mother and grandmother. Without empathy or irony, the letter writer could not see that this permanent forced separation was a searing illustration of the power of an institution that allowed a white family to have control over enslaved women like Lucy and Emmeline. Robert Church shared this 1901 letter with his daughter, Molly, who was by then a mother herself. She was haunted by this matter of fact recounting and recognized this uprooting as representative of the devastating family destruction experienced by all enslaved people sold away from families and friends. Highlighting the hypocrisy of whites who professed to love their mammies, Terrell recounted another piece of her family history to make her white audiences think. Both my grandfathers were white. 
Charlie McCormick, grandson of my grandmother's master, rushed to see and kiss my grandmother before he went and when he returned from school each day. He hugged and kissed her saying, oh, mammy, mammy, I'm so glad to see you. But in spite of their great shows of affection, Terrell observed, neither of her white grandfathers nor their families ever made any move to liberate their slaves. I would be a slave if emancipation had been delayed till the South voluntarily freed the slaves, she proclaimed. Terrell also called attention to the fact that the light skin color of many African Americans was not happenstance. Throughout her life, she insisted on using the word colored rather than black or Negro to describe African Americans. In a debate over what to call the first national secular black women's organization, for instance, Terrell favored the National Association of Colored Women. This was not an attempt to deny her own or black women's African heritage. While studying for over two years in Europe, she recalled, somebody would say, you are rather dark to be an American, aren't you? Yes, I would explain. I am dark because some of my ancestors were Africans. I am proud of having the continent of Africa as part of my ancestral background. I am an African American. She emphasized that people of her race in uh, the United States had many different shades of skin color, ranging, quote, from deep black to the fairest white, unquote. The word colored allowed her to highlight the harsh reality of those with African heritage in America. The fact that black women had been raped by white men. For Terrell, the word colored was an important reminder of black women's lack of autonomy and their insistence on asserting and gaining that autonomy. After her grandmother, Emmeline, was torn from her mother, Lucy, her new master allowed another white man to pursue his desire for her. She gave birth to Robert Reed Church in 1839. Robert's biological father was a white slaveholding friend of Dr. Burton. This was uh, Char Captain Charles B. Church, the luxury steam owner and neighbor and friend of Dr. Burton. When any white man forced an enslaved woman to have sex, any resulting offspring belonged to her owner. Therefore, their owners were often willing to so-called share enslaved women with their friends, highlighting their white supremacy, as well as a manhood imbued with misogynistic racist violence. Dr. Burton gave Captain Church free and open access to the enslaved Emmeline, but after Robert Church's mother, Emmeline, died when she was 30 in 1851, the Burton family sold 12-year-old Robert to his biological father, Captain Church. Robert's father and slaver had promised the dying Emmeline that he would emancipate and educate their son, but he never did so. During the Civil War, the still enslaved Robert courted Louisa Ayers, the enslaved daughter of a white Memphis attorney T.S. Ayers. Robert and Louisa wed in 1862 in a ceremony attended by both of their white enslaver fathers as the witnesses. Louisa Ayers Church had a half sister who was also her young mistress, Laura Ayers Parker. Reflecting the nostalgic affection white families often had for those they enslaved, Parker later wrote to Molly Church Terrell and uh, she did not recognize herself as a relative of Terrell's, but still insisted upon her closeness to Molly's mother and grandmother. Parker nostalgically claimed, your grandmother, Mammy Eliza, your mother's own mother, had been raised in our family and nursed my mother's two children, and we were all devotedly attached to her. She was present when my first child was born and would almost have given her life for my brother and myself and my own son. This was a classic claim of white enslavers to suggest that they knew and loved their bond people well in a relationship of mutual devotion. In her writings and speeches, however, Terrell rejected her grandmother's supposed willingness to almost die for her white charges. Whereas Parker's memories were all about the devotion of her former, of her family's former slaves, Molly's maternal grandmother Eliza provided her with a firsthand perspective on the miseries of enslavement. 
grandmother told me tales of brutality perpetrated upon slaves who belonged to cruel masters, but they affected her and me so deeply, she was rarely able to finish what she began. I tried to keep the tears back and the sobs suppressed so that grandmother would carry the story to the bitter end, but I seldom succeeded. Then she would stop abruptly and refuse to go on. It nearly killed me to think that my dear grandmother, whom I loved so devotedly, had once been a slave. Never mind, honey, she used to say to comfort me, grandma ain't a slave no more. Like the enslaved women on Molly's father's side, Molly's maternal grandmother, Eliza, had also been unable to thwart a white man's lustful advances. Molly pointedly described her maternal grandmother as very dark brown, almost black, but noted that she gave birth to a fair-skinned daughter, Louisa, whose complexion revealed her father's race. In a gesture of affirmation, Louisa Ayers gave her daughter Molly her own mother's name, Eliza, as her middle name. Robert and Louisa Church and their toddler daughter Molly were finally officially freed people when the Civil War ended. Louisa set up a successful hair store that sold hair extensions and wigs to upper-class white women. She brought her family into real financial stability. I don't have a photo of the Memphis store, but this is a later one from uh, New York City where you can actually see the word church on the window. Like his wife, Robert Church strove to be a successful entrepreneur, but had a rockier start. He used his connections with prominent white men he had met on his father's luxury steamboats to obtain loans to open a saloon and billiard hall in Memphis. In mid-April 1865, immediately after Robert E. Lee surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant, Robert Church applied for a billiard license, but a county bureaucrat denied him explicitly on the grounds of his race. Church defiantly set up shop anyway, but by summer 1865, police arrested him for operating without a license. The police brought the charges under the local black codes, laws that had been instituted throughout the South to curb the rights of African-Americans. Church's case went to trial just days after the US Congress passed the Federal Civil Rights Bill of 1866, which overturned the black codes. Therefore, Molly's father won his case, Church v. State of Tennessee in a historic decision. As a business entrepreneur who had successfully defied the local re regulations meant to constrain African Americans, Robert Church personified the threat to white supremacy that emancipation and reconstruction represented. That made him a target for white violence. On May 1st, 1866, just days after the court decision in his favor, the Memphis massacre began. As tensions over Reconstruction increased and as conflicts between white police officers and African-American veterans of the Union Army turned violent. White working class resentments against those freed people in Memphis who had started businesses and were prospering also sparked violence. The mainly Irish police force led the Memphis riots. Whites killed 46 black citizens, raped at least five black women, and burned many African Americans' churches and schools to the ground. Louisa Church and their daughter, Molly, huddled inside their home during the riot, but Robert Church ventured out to protect his saloon. He was shot by rioting police officers, as Molly recounted later, in the back of his head at his place of business and left for dead. He had been warned by friends that he was one of the colored men to be shot. They and my mother begged him not to leave that day, but he went to work as usual in spite of the peril he knew he faced. He undoubtedly would have been shot to death if the rioters had not believed that they had finished him when he fell to the ground. Although he had a burnt bullet permanently lodged in his head, Molly's father survived. After the Memphis massacre, Robert Church had to rebuild his severely injured body, business, and temperament. The couple, church couple began to have marital difficulties. Louisa could provide for the family, but she was unable to heal her husband, who was a changed man. The bullet lodged in his head made him desperately moody. 
but remarkably, despite the persistent pain, Robert Church survived and thrived, eventually amassing a fortune through shrewd property purchases and by making important political connections in Memphis that cemented his status as a leader in the Black community and in Tennessee's Republican Party. Reconstruction, even after it was recast by the radical Republicans in 1867, carried dangers for Black Americans. Robert Church knew this too well, and after the Memphis massacre, decided to carry a gun at all times for self-protection. Molly remembered at least two incidents when her father brandished it in front of her. In one, a white conductor called her a hateful slur and tried to force young Molly into a segregated train car until her father showed him his gun. This show of determination, along with Robert's white complexion, enabled Molly to remain in her seat. She did not understand what she had done wrong, reporting to her mother that she was well-dressed and behaving appropriately. She never forgot this first of many times that she was treated harshly by train conductors. Thinking back to the tears in her mother's eyes as she tried to offer comfort, Molly reflected, seeing their children touched and seared and wounded by race prejudice is one of the heaviest crosses which colored women have to bear. Her personal experiences with racism and discrimination inspired her later work as a civil rights activist. Just before her eighth birthday, in the fall of 1871, Molly's parents sent her away to be educated in the North. Their daughter was an exceptionally smart child and a quick learner. To give her daughter the best possible education, Louisa chose the model school affiliated with Antioch College, developed by the educator Horace Mann in uh, Yellow Springs, Ohio. For the rest of her youth, Molly never lived full time with any member of her family again, yet she was a resilient and often joyful child and generally rebounded from the separation from her family. Louisa had made a good decision, her daughter concluded. Fate surely smiled upon me when she influenced my mother to send me to a school for children connected with Antioch College. When I contrast what my educational foundation would have been if I had remained in Memphis and been sent to the school for colored children, poorly equipped as those schools were then, with what was it was in this model, model school, I lift up my heart in gratitude to my dear mother for her foresight and for the sacrifice she made on my behalf. Although Molly enjoyed her schoolings and had many friends among the white students, she was not immune to racist barbs. Once her white classmates mockingly denied that she could be both black and pretty. Molly could not shake the memory of their taunting. I could hear the voice of ridicule crying out, your face is pretty black. Such experiences led her to, to develop strong empathy for others treated badly on the basis of race. Whenever a Chinaman passed and passed by and children black as well as white sang out derisively, ching ching Chinaman, do you eat rats? I invariably reminded the colored children that just as they made fun of Chinese people, many people made fun of us. Molly began to fight for her beliefs. She recognized that racial difference marked Chinese and African Americans as others in a predominantly white society. Choosing to confront white students about their prejudice led Molly into playground fights. I would run up to white children and declare with too much emphasis, emphasis and feeling, perhaps, that I liked the Chinaman's pretty yellow complexion better than I did their pale white one. Of course, there were always consequences of various kinds after such a speech, which were often decidedly unpleasant, but I made up my mind to stand them, whatever they were. Being the target of racist taunts and remembering the terrors of slavery from her grandmother Eliza, Molly vowed to prove through her own academic achievements that African Americans could overcome their history of enslavement and subjection and be recognized as full citizens. She did so well academically that she was able to attend Oberlin College where Molly insisted on taking the classical four-year so-called gentleman's course at Oberlin rather than the two years ladies course taken by virtually all white and black female students uh, because she was determined to graduate with a bachelor of arts degree rather than an associate of arts degree. Therefore, 
Molly Church was often the only woman at Oberlin enrolled in fields of study considered exclusively to the domain of men. Her friends pointed out that Latin and Greek were hard and that it was unnecessary, if not positively unwomanly, for girls to study, as Molly remembered them putting it, an old dead language anyway. Worst of all, it might ruin my chances of getting a husband, since men were notoriously shy of women who knew too much. Molly wanted to marry and had to ignore the common belief that higher education damaged women and made them unmarriageable. As she pointed out, the world laughed at women students or scolded them according to its mood, then read the riot act to them and tried to deal a death blow to this new departure by warning young women that they would never be able to get a husband if they insisted upon taking a college course. She worried that the naysayers could be right, but chose to take that risk and defying convention. Happily noting, lo and behold, it was discovered that women who have higher education in mathematics, philosophy, and Greek make affectionate wives, fond and devoted mothers, and safe, sane, and conservative cooks. Enjoying her gift for languages, Molly refused to restrict her studies on the basis of sex, just as she resisted racist prescriptions throughout her life. In spite of studying diligently, Molly Church enjoyed herself and her friends. As she described it, while I studied hard at Oberlin and availed myself of all the opportunities afforded, I did not deprive myself of any pleasure I could rightfully enjoy. She especially loved doing silly pranks and dancing, as she said, with her white and black friends there. 75 years later, a dear white friend remembered that she had first caught sight of Molly during a social hour after dinner, having been attracted by pleasant voices and laughter and fascinated by the central figure. She was evidently the admiration of her group of men and women students who was, she was entertaining in the inimitable way which was Molly Church's great gift throughout her life. When Molly Church received her bachelor's degree in 1884 and then a master's degree soon after, she became one of only a few black women in the United States to have earned both degrees and decided that she would not lead a life of idleness. She said, I made up my mind that it was definitely wrong for me to remain idle. I could not be happy leading a purposeless existence. So she decided that she would get a job as a teacher. But her father, Robert Church, had become very successful and wanted to play the role of the generous patriarch, just as wealthy white men did for their daughters and wives. As Molly put it, naturally, my father was the product of his environment. In the South for nearly 300 years, real ladies did not work and my father was thoroughly imbued with that idea. He wanted his daughter to be a lady. But Molly maintained that she had been reared among Yankees and had imbibed the Yankee spirit for work. At 22, she accepted a job at Wilberforce University in Ohio, starting in the fall of 1885. Knowing that her father was, uh, quote, unalterably opposed to my teaching anywhere, Molly Church took a calculated risk by taking the position at Wilberforce. She did not tell him about her new appointment until after she had moved there. He responded with anger and refused to communicate with her for an entire academic year, but Molly declared, my conscience was clear and I knew that I had done right to use my training on behalf of my race. During the summer after her first year at Wilberforce, Molly decided to return to Memphis uninvited. Before she got on the train, she let her father know via a telegram that she would arrive. She pointed to the irony that whereas some girls run away from home to marry the man of their choice and thus brook their father's displeasure, I left home and ran the risk of permanently alienating my father from myself in order to engage in the work which his money had prepared me to do. Fortunately, his fury had ended and he was there waiting on the platform to see her. From her enslaved grandmothers on both sides, Molly learned about the terrors of enslavement, but also about her grandmother's capacity to love and to hope for better lives for themselves, their children and grandchildren. From her white grandfathers, she learned the moral complexities of a thoroughly evil system. She knew that Captain Church had treated his son Robert kindly, but also that he had never educated or emancipated him. 
T.S. Ayers was similarly content to provide his enslaved daughter Louisa with an elegant wedding in his home, but also expected her to continue living there as the enslaved nursemaid or mammy to his white daughter Laura's baby. As a civil rights activist, Molly Church drew on her own family history to critique White's nostalgia for the system of enslavement, a nostalgia that never acknowledged the real harm done to enslaved family members who were separated, humiliated, and treated as less than fully human. She also constantly affirmed the rights and full humanity of all African Americans. Thank you very much, and I'll be happy to take any questions you might have. Excellent and just an intriguing story. Thank you so much, Allison. I have no questions in the chat as of yet, but I would definitely like to have conversation with you about besides the stories of her maternal and paternal grandmothers, what else do you think might have been an impetus for her to kind of shed the uh, class notion and just simply turning away and living an isolated life without having to bear the brunt of the, the race issue? because of her education and her class, she could have very well just lived a life in isolation, apart from those ugly abuses that were heaped upon people of color who were less economically sound. What do you think was really the driving motivation to live a life of sacrifice and articulation on behalf of Black women or colored women, as she preferred? Yeah, um, I think that she had the opportunity to live in Europe and marry oh, uh, several white men who uh, actually um, proposed to her when she was a student living there for two and a half years. And she strongly considered that as an option um, because she knew that it would be easier. And especially outside of America, I don't think she ever wanted to pass in America, but, um, and she didn't really want to pass in Europe either, but she noted that it was easier to be uh, black there. And that also her skin tone was such that she could be mistaken for being um, Spanish or you know Italian. And so there was always that kind of ambiguity for her. But in America, she couldn't entirely pass even if she had wanted to, I would argue, because it was always a, a risk. And th there were many times when she was called out and, and abused by conductors and various people. Um, she did insist that passing was an important thing to do when she was traveling on the trains, because she felt that um, it was dangerous to travel in the segregated cars that were um, full of white and black men who were smoking. And she did not want to be in that kind of a car. And so she was often terrified, but tried as hard as she could to pass while she was traveling through the South. Um, but then she would go and give a speech that was all about civil rights. So it wasn't like she was ever trying to deny her race. And she um, and Paul Lawrence Dunbar both had this idea that Dunbar called, it was like a trickster idea, that if there's a law that's completely unfair and irrational, then congratulations to you if you can manage to subvert it and to, you know, to sit in a white section or do something different. So that was part of what she would say. Excellent. We have one question that asked about how long she was teaching before she was married. And then, of course, the romance of how she met Robert Terrell, the judge. Yes, yes. Um, she was she taught for a, a year in Wilberforce and then was invited to come and teach at M Street uh, what was called the uh, Colored Public High School, which was quite a prestigious school. Um, and she was tempted by that offer, really interested in the possibility of teaching young, promising African-American teenagers. Uh, and so she joined the uh, basically classical language department and was teaching Greek and Latin. And the head of that department at the time was Robert Terrell. So that is how they met. And um, he was also somebody who had been born enslaved and lived as a slave until he was seven, because he was a little bit older than her. And then he moved to DC, went to the M Street School, but eventually uh, graduated from Harvard University. And he was one of the very first graduates and especially one of the ones to graduate with honors. So when he came back, 
they were really meant for each other. He was not at all threatened by her education. And she used to joke that she found the perfect man because all of the things that people at Oberlin had warned her about, you know, she found somebody who became a lawyer and then a municipal court judge, uh, the first black municipal court judge in DC. So they were a power couple <laughs> and uh, they uh, had a very deep and, um, really poignant love affair and romance. And um, I was very privileged to be able to read the letters at the Terrell's family, the Langston family in Highland Beach, Maryland, which was a black beach resort actually first developed by Charles Douglas, the son of Frederick Douglas in 1893. And um, right now, Mary Church Terrell's house is next door to Frederick Douglass's house. The Terrell or Langston family lives in the Terrell house and the uh, Douglas house is a museum that's open to the public by appointment. And so it's quite a remarkable place and their, their private letters there were, enabled me to see the depth of their love and their relationship with each other. Quite fascinating. It sounds like a movie or a Netflix. I mean, since we're on to I know, think so. <laughs> romance and such. Uh, there's another question that's inquiring about the NACW. Could you really explain that when you said that she preferred the term colored? I know Mrs. Bethune preferred the word Negro. So what does that mean in terms of language? And of course, she being the founding president of the NACW, what does that mean for that organization's trajectory as well? Well, I did you say Mrs. Bethune? No, I'm talking about Mary, Mary Church Terrell because she was NACW, no, but, but then Mrs. Bethune preferred okay. Negro for her organization. So it was interesting right. how that sense of self-identity kind of is projected upon a group. So right. is there a parallel do you see between the two of them in terms of that? Yeah, um, I mean, they, they, were, they were friends and they worked together for decades. Um, so I think that the argument wasn't that particular argument in some ways wasn't particularly bitter in the sense that I think people understood the various reasons why you would pick one or th over the other. Negro was difficult because at, Terrell never liked that word. She felt like it was a, a potentially a slur and, and she um, wasn't comfortable with it. So she resisted using it as much as possible. Sometimes it's used in published writings by her, but that's because the editor changed it from colored. So, you know, the, the publishers sometimes decided to, to take a different approach. Um, but it, really what they all had in mind is that they wanted a national united secular organization run by black women whatever they were gonna be called, that would allow them to fight for all of the issues that they were unable to do because they basically were not allowed in for one thing to a lot of white women's organizations. So there were a lot of different white women's organizations at the time. This was kind of a peak time for organizing for white women, but black women had lots of local clubs and it was uh, women like Josephine Ruffin and Mary Church Terrell and a variety of others who had these ideas all across the nation that they wanted to take their local clubs and turn themselves into a national organization so that they could speak as one in a way that would give them a voice on the national stage. So it's really about trying to assert themselves. And uh, already by 1896, Terrell was a strong, suffragist who had participated in lots of conventions uh, of the um, National Association, uh, National American Woman Suffrage Association. So she was, she was um, working with white women, but found that white women weren't willing to listen to black women like her when they said, you need to take consideration of the disenfranchisement of black men and the, basically the way that the 14th amendment is being ignored. And white women said, that's not our problem. You know, we don't really care about that. Um, we are really just looking for votes for ourselves. And if you wanna kind of come along for the ride, fine, but not if you uh, distract us, right, from our main cause. So they felt like, well, we need to have our own organization so that when we talk about suffrage, we're talking about the voting rights of black men and women. Right. So they never separated that out. And so the, the obviously anti-lynching was another very specific thing, as well as uh, 
opposing the Jim Crow segregation laws. These were all things that they needed a national organization to have to be able to do. And there were um, kind of religious based organizations, but they didn't feel like those were uh, out from under men's control enough. The ministers had a lot of control in, in those uh, larger organizations that were the you know, as affiliates, things like that. So they wanted to be their own separate thing. And seeing how she was kind of an unconventional woman of her time, she morphs her protest from the kind of presentation she was doing. There was one she gave, I believe, in Germany, if you could talk about that, that she actually joins picket lines with pickets as a, as a rather octogenarian. Could you look at the idea of how she chose to grow her protest from the, I guess, the refined way of conversation and polite ways into the more direct action protests prior to the Brown versus the Board of Education before she passes away? Yes, except for that my argument is that basically uh, it's not exactly as simple as that in that I don't really accept the notion that she became radicalized with old age and only when she had less to lose um, in the uh, post-World War II era. Um, I see examples of direct action protest from very early on. And um, one example would be her determination and her interest in marching in the 1913 uh, suffrage parade in DC, um, where she also fought for the right of the deltas, the Delta Sigma Theta sorority to march as the Howard delegation. And also there were dozens of black women who marched throughout that entire parade under a variety of banners, whether it was as neat teachers, as nurses, you know, a whole variety of things. Um, so, so she was doing direct action marching right there. Then she was picketing in um, World War I with the uh, National Women's Party. She and her daughter, um, and there's at least one other woman who have been documented as black women who participated in the picketing. Um, she was really proud of having done that and she wasn't afraid of being arrested. She didn't happen to get arrested, but she wasn't afraid of being arrested. So that to me suggests that she wasn't that worried about it. I also mentioned that she had developed an organization during World War I called the Women Wage Earners Association that was pro-union and trying to get black women to unionize. So these are not, you know, this is not somebody who's really worrying about her respectability early on, right? And, and then in the 30s, she's participating, just to give another set of examples, she's participating in the um, don't shop no, don't shop where you can't work campaigns, right? Um, and then, of course, she's later participating in more boycotts and protests, but that's not the first time. So I don't see it as um, different. I see it as more successful later because by the time you get after World War II, the civil rights movement is growing and the black freedom struggle is growing. And it, it's like everybody's catching up with where she's been. So she's not all of a sudden doing this work, but this work is becoming more successful in that there are more times the outcome is favorable to the protesters. That's what I would say. Excellent response. There's a question about her relationship with the so-called power brokers of the NAACP. Do you see a relationship there? I know Ida B. Wells is one of the founders of the NAACP and she kind of becomes somewhat disillusioned with them as well. Could you talk about Terrell's relationship to that organization? Yeah, um, I mean, I think she was always really proud to have been a founding member. She had been a member of the Constitution League with Du Bois and, um, John Milholland, and they had uh, really worked on a lot of the issues, the really challenging segregation, uh, insisting on black pol political participation and you know, all those kinds of things um, in the early 1900s. And then when she and Ida B. Wells as the only two black women to sign the founding documents, you know, played that really important uh, role and she argued for Du Bois becoming the editor of the crisis when there was a debate about whether he should do it and who should do it. Um, however, the relationship between Du Bois and Terrell was, it wasn't hostile, but it also they weren't um, incredibly friendly. And from what I could tell, they both had very big egos. They both thought uh, very highly of themselves. And Du Bois actually was quite a flirt and really liked 
women who would play um, a certain kind of role with him. And she wasn't interested in that and she was very happily married. Um, and so he, uh, he kind of snubbed her. So, so they worked together for decades, don't get me wrong, but they weren't close. And so that's how I would describe. So intellectually, they were completely aligned um, because they both believed in, you know, especially at the time when they started this whole notion of the talented 10th and, um, supporting higher education for Blacks, obviously both of them. He had a PhD from Harvard. She had a master's degree as well as a bachelor's degree um, from, you know, and had studied classical languages and was fluent in five and six if you count English. So, you know, she was not um, a Booker T. Washington uh, tech, you know, technological education is the only thing for Blacks kind of person. But um, but they they never had a, a close bond, is what I would say. We have room for just one more question, and this is interesting. It says, in conducting your research, what did you learn about her friendship with Anna Julia Cooper and Ida Gibbs Hunt? She was very good friends with Ida Gibbs Hunt. They had been roommates at Oberlin, and um, they stayed friends for their entire lives until they were in their, you know, late '80s, early '90s. And um, they wrote to each other, including when Hunt was living abroad with her husband, who was serving as an ambassador. Um, and so, you know, she uh, was really always thinking about colonial and post-colonial issues and using her friendship with Hunt as a way to bring that information back to the uh, National Association of Colored Women and also the International Council of Women of the Darker Races. And uh, a long title, um, but those, those were uh, very close relationships. In terms of Anna Julia Cooper, um, they were compatriots, they worked together for the, you know, also for most of their lives. They were on boards of almost every organization together, um, but they weren't super close and really friendly. And part of it, as I, when I was looking at um, her love letters that she's exchanging with Robert Terrell when she's gone for two and a half years, um, Anna Julia Cooper continues teaching as a young, beautiful, brilliant widow at um, M Street while she's gone. And I think he's trying to kind of get a little bit of jealousy on Molly's part. So maybe she'll come back and marry him. So he starts mentioning his lovely conversations and rides, you know, and whatever with, with Anna Julia uh, Cooper. And I think that Molly, you know, is not entirely thrilled with that. So there was a little bit of tension, but, uh, but not in terms of their work. It was, it was this, um, I don't know, I, I, I don't have a lot of information about it, but there's a few letters that are pretty funny where she's casting some shade upon Anna Julia Cooper. I think that's great in terms of showing her as human and making yeah. her much more humane so that we can see a kaleidoscopic personality in terms of that. And I can have one last question I'd like to sneak in is um, other places in DC, how deep is her footprint in Washington, DC? And we know the national and international scene, but have you looked at her locally and see how big her footprint was in Washington, DC? Yeah, I mean, she she lived here for over 60 years. So um, she was everywhere. And um, in terms of the house in um, Ledroit Park, that is in horrible shape. I read recently that Howard University, which owns it, is beginning to restore it. I sincerely hope that that is true. Um, she actually had another house in the so-called Gold Coast area um, at, on like 16th, closer to DuPont Circle. Um, and that house is in perfectly nice shape. And it's it, where she lived for the last 30 years of her life. And there's not a plaque or anything on it. And that is something that um, I was actually talking with Mr. Eric White about that and suggesting that maybe the uh, DC branch of Asala might actually want to look into that and see if there's a way to, it's a private home. But if they be able or uh, on the public sidewalk, you know, be able to have some kind of a, a plaque because that is where she did a lot of her work from and would be as relevant perhaps as the house where she raised her family. 
That's excellent. And that's great because it ties into the suffrage era because if you're talking the last 30 years for life, that's 50, 40s, yeah, around that 30s, 20s, 30s time. So that's great. You're getting a lot of positive feedback from the chat. Lots of great thank yous. I'm going to also uh, close this program out and say thank you so much, uh, Dr. Parker, or Allison, my new best friend <laughs> at University of Delaware for your work and your uh, uh, your passion about excavating this woman's life and understanding the kind of tenuous nature of being a formerly enslaved, a child of enslaved persons and a person of light complexion and where that kind of ancestry comes from. So I want to thank you for that. I, if I had a copy of your book, I'd hold it up, but you had a slide of that. So everyone should go out and purchase. Yes, shameless plug. I'm <laughs> exactly. militant. <laughs> to take a look at that book and definitely kind of learn more about the life and the politics and the polemics of one Mary Church Terrell. So I want to thank you also very much for joining us and stay tuned for us on March 28th. We will have Dr. Paula Seniors talking about May Mallory and a, a fictive kin network of Black women and sisterhood. So thank you so very much and uh, enjoy the rest of Black History Month. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I think she'll take us off the recording.